in light of all this talk of synods here and synods there in the church these days, I thought it might be good to revisit our one of my favorite popes anyway, Pope Leo XIII. He wrote a short but poignant encyclical on this very subject. Let's compare what he has to say here versus the things we see today. So with that, I bring you Pastoralis on Religious Union by Pope Leo XIII, promulgated in 1891. Beloved sons, venerable brethren, health and the apostolic benediction. The noble meeting lately held at Braga, the news of which a very welcome letter on the part of those who were present conveyed to us at its completion, has given another proof of the pastoral watchfulness wherewith you devote your efforts to the preservation and strengthening of faith. In reading that letter, we were delighted both with the solicitous zeal of the bishop of the diocese where the meeting was received, one who was the chief founder of the movement and presided over it to successful issues, and with the piety and energy of the bishops who were associated with him, or had sent worthy representatives to that meeting, and with the notable gathering of men chosen carefully from the clergy and laity, preeminent in learning, virtue, and authority. That meeting was the more gratifying to us on the account of the admirable unanimity of principle and the determination of such decisions as would most powerfully work for the prosperity of the Church and the progress of Catholicity. Nor will we conceal that besides the resolutions which we opportunely carried by unanimous consent as peculiarly appropriate to the time and the place, those propositions which express the devoted sentiment and zeal of the members towards the apostolic see, to the effect that due honor should ever be paid to its dignity, that no title of its majesty or its rights should be reft from it, brought to us no little comfort. We are indeed of good hope that the resolutions which were agreed upon at that meeting, so long as they are observed with care and perseverance, will effect a plentiful harvest of fruitfulness. But we and ourselves compelled to observe that a rich field still remains that demands your labor and your industry. Wherefore, although quite recently we addressed you by letter on the Catholic position and its needs in Portugal, and of the course to be pursued for the most convenient accomplishment, nevertheless we are induced to add that letter to some words which we hold fitting to communicate to you, lest, since an occasion for writing of yours has occurred, we should be wanting in duty. You must be aware, beloved sons, venerable brethren, of the truth which was perfectly appreciated at the Congress of Braga, that it has come to pass that the faith itself is among many in danger, and that every effect must be made, though that ignorance or, or indifference should not fall and fail from souls, but rather that it should take deep root in hearts, and should bring forth in good works and the practice of virtue a glad and plentiful sweetness of perfect fruits. Strife must be made against the attempts of the enemies of truth, lest the evil stain which drops from their bad example and their widely disseminated teaching should spread more and more. Any hardships still impact the souls of the faithful, which happily it is impossible to overcome, may at least be lightened. These needs which, as we have said, demand your care and industry, will be more fully and more suitably attended to if, day by day, the concord between the bishops is strengthened, and if their work is made more cooperative in remedying the needs of clergy and laity, and taking counsel and making such decisions as shall seem to align best with the common good, both for the particular requirements of separated dioceses and for those that each reach farther and rise higher, with which the prosperity and the weal of the whole people are associated. The convenience of a stricter bond of union between the bishops did not escape the prudence of those who met at Braga. Wherefore, those resolutions of that great meeting were the most gratifying to us, which recommended the founding of such a bond, through which the faithful look for ampler and lasting benefits for those rulers who are their directors and their guides. Now, to achieve this permanent and perfect union, nothing is more effective than the custom already practiced in other countries, that besides the meetings at which the lady assists, such as that at Braga, there should be every year special meetings of the bishops, a custom which you have at heart, and which we greatly desire to see introduced among you, since the benefits accruing by its means to religion are made evident by the manifold and constant memory of experience. From, for from the habit of such meetings there first follows, as we have said, a notable unanimity and compactness of strength, which of itself is potent to, being, to bring great designs to successful issues. Moreover, the hearts of the bishops are more keenly moved to action. Confidence is confirmed and minds are enlightened by common counsel in the light of wisdom, shining from one to another. 
In addition to this, by these conferences, the ways in a manner prepared both for diocesan and for provincial synods, for the meeting of the National Council, for holding of which we rejoice to know that you are anxious. Since our long experience of the advantage being gained therefrom, strongly approved of it, the prescriptions of the sacred canons commend it in a marked manner. Moreover, from the annual meetings of bishops of which we speak, this great benefit also flows, that the laity, moved to greater zeal by new impulses, resolved to walk in the path set for them, themselves to hold meetings to join in council, and by a union of strength to strive for the common cause of religion, and in obedience to their pastors, to perform sedulously those duties which they accept from their teachings and exhortations. Nor in your annual assemblies will you find that there is a lack of matter whereunto to devote your zeal and your energy. For beyond the special business of the separate dioceses, which can more easily be furthered under the light of shared experience, the ordering of those works which are most effective for rousing the zeal of the priesthood already laboring in the Lord's vineyard, and for the education of students who will one day have to shine in the house of God with the light of solid wisdom, with the merit of a true ecclesiastical spirit, with every sacerdotal virtue, this will afford a large field of work to your prudence in your common deliberations. Another matter which will require your fatherly watchfulness will be the diligent inquiry into the means of best filling the mind of the people with the rudiments of faith, of directing their morals, of circulating writings which sow the seeds of faith and making for virtue, of setting afoot works which shall pour out the benefits of charity and securing, that those already founded shall be confirmed in new strength. Finally, a very important subject of your debates will consist in the opportunity to afford to you of founding and affiliating religious societies in Portugal, the interests of which we rejoice to see that all who met at Braga had deeply at heart. For these sodidalities not only contribute, as it were, auxiliary forces to the clergy who follow in your diocese as the sacred army of Christ, but also, and this is of crucial importance, they will supply apostolic men for work of the holy missions and countries subject to the dominion of Portugal and lands beyond the seas. The fulfillment of this function will work both for the prosperity of Christ's kingdom on earth and for the glory and honor of the Portuguese name. In truth, your rulers and your ancestry have obtained a, a deathless glory in which that carry to the vast regions discovered by them the light of gospel truth with a Catholicity under the favor and assistance of the apostolic see. But the strength and glory of these noble beginnings may still remain and may never fail from that ancient stability and splendor. There is need that they be upheld by the unwavering care and support of eminent men, who, filled with the divine spirit and ever vigilant against the moves of heresy, shall devote all their zeal, all their energy, that the benefits which have flowed out of Portugal into these countries may, so far from wanting, flourish with the infusion of a fresh strength. It will be the duty of such men to effect that they have already believed in God may be increased in faith, that they whose faith is strong may practice ideals of honorable living, religious worship, diligence, and duties fulfillment. Lastly, that they who still lie in darkness may be brought to the knowledge of God and to the light of the gospel. Now the religious associations whose members in the judgment of prudent men, to which the experience of time, all time testifies, have fulfilled this ministry of salvation, no less gladly than laboriously, will be happy, able to supply men burning with holy zeal, for the rule and discipline of societies to which they belong, as well as the virtue of each trained in constant exercise, is likely to produce men efficient before all others for such work as this. We are indeed persuaded that the, Port the Portuguese state lending a favorable hearing to your councils and judging at their highest value those benefits which come before all others, will of its own accord abolish all the obstacles that block the way to the liberty of these societies, and will lend its aid to further your endeavors, which are directed to this end that the Catholic faith may flourish and grow strong with its ancestral glory. Now, although this doctrine is applicable to all peoples, most especially does it affect the Portuguese, among whom the influence of the Catholic religion in training the character and disposition of men, in fostering the study of science, letters, and arts, in kindling the soul to every civic and virtue, has been so great, even though so that she seems, as it were, the mother and from on high, to bring forth and train whatever gentleness, dignity, and glory shone. On this subject, we should have treated more fully the recorded encyclical letter which we lately addressed to you. What is important to recall at present is that the power of the faith should suffer no darkening, because those doctrines which the Church, under God, teaches are restrained by no limits of time and place, but are bound up with the salvation and comfort of all people. This is the reason why those high benefits and strong safeguards, which she brought out of old time to your noble nation, she is still ready to bring for the advancement of your prosperity and your fame, and particularly at this unhappy time, when weakness of spirit so abounds that the highest principles upon which the order and tranquility of human society depend are boldly moved against, nay, are brought even to totter, none can be ignorant 
how necessary is the observance of the faith in those holy councils and teachings which religion enforces. It is the unanimous agreement of all principled and honored men that there is no remedy more efficacious and potent against the evils by which our age is facing, against the perils in store, than the Catholic doctrine. If it were received whole and incorrupt, and if mankind walk in that way of life which its practice demands. Wherefore we do not doubt, beloved sons, venerable brethren, that you will, with your well-known pastoral zeal, hasten with strength and constancy of spirit to set your hands to the work we have commended to you. Thus will it be your high praise and just congratulation that in your labors you were able to deserve most nobly of the religion which you uphold so well, and of your country and for your people, for whom you, no less than ourselves, greatly desire an unbroken tranquility and a lease of perfect prosperity. Meantime, praying God to fill you with his holy gifts and graciously to favor your designs, we grant lovingly in the Lord the apostolic benediction. In witness to our fatherly affection to whom you and the clergy and faithful are entrusted to your care. Given at Rome at St. Peter's on the 25th of June, 1891, in the 14th year of our pontificate, Pope Leo XIII.